Hi guys! So before we will proceed to the sequence diagram, um, my takeaway, by the way, from our uh, from our state diagram discussion is that I believe that um, when you created your class diagram in the class-based modeling, um, you only indicated the attributes or properties of the class and also the methods and operations of the class. In the state diagram, we specify and elaborate all the events happen to the class and, of course, the system behavior. Okay. This time, uh, we need to discuss about the second type of the behavioral representation indicates how the events cause transitions from one object to another. Okay. In the state diagram, we focus on the behavior or state of a specific object. This time, uh, we will look at the interactions of the object or the interactions of the system objects in response to events. Okay, so let's talk about the sequence diagram. Okay, uh, we can also say that a sequence diagram is actually an elaboration of the use case diagram. A sequence diagram is actually a shorthand version of the use case. It represents key classes and the events that cause behavior to flow from one class to another class. Um, it describes in detail the potential objects that interact, uh, that interact given a particular use case. Um, specifically, um, the sequence diagram by the way class depicts the objects and classes involved, uh, involved in the scenario and the, uh, in the use case scenario and the sequence of messages exchanged between the objects needed to carry out the functionality of the scenario. Take note, it is arranged in a time sequence. Okay, so later on I will show you an example and I want you to make sure that um, um, you read it from the top going to the bottom. Okay? Okay, so let us take note or let's have a first look at the notations that we're going to use in the sequence diagram. So first, we represent the objects who interact with each other or uh, who interact with each other to implement a use case. So basically, we will represent all the use case scenarios here in the sequence diagram. So we use a rectangle with a colon, then um, the object name or the class name, okay? So based on the example, uh, we use the student, one moment, we use the, um, the student, uh, we use the student admission use case and identify the classes and also the objects, okay? So again, if, we, uh, if we're going to use an object, Take note that it should be placed in a rectangle. Then there should be a, a colon. Okay, the label here is the name of the class or the object, or they call it object with colon to pertain. The colon here it pertain that this is not an entity, not a process, but it is an object. Without a colon, um, it will represent other meaning. So take note that you need to include a colon so that it will pertain an object only. Okay, so basically in the student admission, uh, we have four identified objects. So we have um, new student, we have student, we have dorm, and we also have the program. Okay, next one here. So we also have another notation. Um, this is the parallel vertical lines are drawn to represent the instanti uh, instantiation of an object. We call this actually a lifelines. Okay, lifelines here. It's a vertical uh, lines here. You can see that. Okay. So if an object is destroyed or removed from a memory, an X, you can see an X, this one. An X is drawn at the bottom of the lifeline. So basically, our lifeline here, this is the line. Okay. 
And if you can see uh, a X here, that means it's already destroyed. The object will be destroyed in this part. Okay, so based on this example, uh, we will use the class dorm. Okay, we will use the class dorm. So starting from its instantiation, it will be uh, it will be uh, it will be destroyed at this stage when you see an X. Okay, next one we have the activation bar. Okay, the activation bar is placed on the top of the lifeline. It is used to indicate that an object is active or instantiated during an interaction between two objects. The length of the rectangle, this one actually, the activation, the activation bar, this one, or the uh, this one. Okay, so uh, meaning the length of the rectangle indicates the duration of the objects while staying active. Okay, if we will check the new student here, if we will start from the new student object, um, basically um, the dorm, it will be used in the second sequence, okay? And also the program, it will be used only on the third sequence. But the student, we can use the student object um, there's an interaction between the new student, also the student object, for the entire event or for the entire flow. Okay, you've noticed that one here. Okay, so we also have the horizontal arrows. So since we're done discussing about the lifelines, um, the uh, the X that destroys the object, or that means that's already the ending of the interaction. Also, we have the activation bar. This time, we need to discuss about the messages. Okay, uh, the messages is actually represented by the horizontal arrows. These arrows. Okay, these arrows. Okay, there you go. Um, objects in general um, communicate with one another through messages. Arrows will tell us that there is an interaction from one object to another. So data is actually exchanged during the message passing. A message can flow in any direction from left to right, right to left, or back to the message caller itself. While you can describe the message being sent from one object to another object on the arrow. With different arrowheads, we can indicate the type of message being sent or received. So if you will notice that the student sent a message to the uh, the new student object sent a message uh, the initialize message or the initialize operation um, it will be sent to the student object so the student object will also return a student number okay again there is a recipient um there uh if you will send a message of course um, there are some instances that you will receive as well, or there is a response, but it's not all the time. Okay, so as shown in the activation bars example, a synchronous message is used when the sender waits for the receiver to process the message and return before carrying on another message. If we will talk about the synchronous message, we're talking about this one, okay? We're talking about this one, okay? The arrowhead used to indicate this type of message is a solid one, like the one, uh, like the one shown in the example. That means that the new student, uh, the new student object will send a message, uh, will send a synchronous message, which is the select program directly to the program object and as well the program object will also send asynchronously a message from the program advisor to the new student so this is what we call synchronous and we also have asynchronous okay i will explain to you uh, asynchronous so if a message caller does not need to wait for the receiver to process the message 
and return before sending other messages to other objects within the system, the arrowhead used to show this type of message is a line arrow, this one. Okay? This type of messaging, it's called asynchronous. Okay? Take note on that one. Again, just like what I said earlier, if, the, if an object will send a message to, a, uh, to another object, if there is a response, um, that's what we call synchronous message. If there will be no response or if, if, um, if it's not necessarily, that means that's asynchronous. Okay? Here. So let us, um, let us dissect the sequence diagram. Like I said, a sequence diagram binary class represents the scenario or flow of events in one single use case. The message flow of the sequence diagram is based on the narrative of the particular use case. It illustrates how the different classes or objects of a system interact with each other to carry out a function and order uh, and also the order in which the interactions um, occur when a particular use case is executed. So this example depicts a sequence of object interactions from one student admission, uh, from the student admission use case. So we have, I know that I discussed this one already, but let me have a proper flow of discussion. So we will start from the new student object. So in the new student object, um, the new student object sent a message which is the initialize method directly to the student object then the student object returns a sync uh, returns an asynchronous message which is the student number without the student number um, the student will not select a dorm okay so the dorm will now will also return a dorm room okay after um, the dorm or the object dorm returns a dorm room to the new student the new student right now has the capability to select a program, okay? Which the program object uh, will return a program advisor. Um, let's say if the program that you have selected, it's good or if you're in line to that kind of program. So there will be a asynchronous message that will be sent to the new student. So after that, the student um, uh, will send a message directly to the student object that the student will be completed by using this operation. So, of course, uh, there will be another um, message that will be sent to the new student. It will be return success. Don't forget that the termination, or sorry, um, the destruction, or uh, sorry, um, the object destroyed after this part. Okay, you will see this. Okay? So again, class, um, the use case begins with the registration of the student. So here. So it ends, by the way, uh, the time when these objects are instantiated and destroyed are also seen here. You can see X here. Okay? So from registration, going to selecting a program then the student will receive a success or the student will be completed. Okay? Again, this is for student admission. Okay?